this your prayer this morning church holy spirit
As we come to our time of prayer, I'd like to remind you that our altar is open if you'd like to come up and pray in that way. I have a couple of uh, prayer concerns that I'd lift up, like to lift up before the community. Um, first off, we want to lift up um, Mary Thompson. She has been moved to a hospital in Athens to be closer to her daughter. So please pray for her in that transition and their family as they seek to take better care of her. Um, Virginia Brooks is also in the hospital, so please keep her in your prayers this week. Um, sympathies go to Peggy Connor and family in the death of Peggy's mother and also to the family of Betty Harden in the death of Ronnie Harden. Um, his uh, visitation will be Monday from 5 to 7 at McMullen and the funeral will be Tuesday at 11 o'clock in the morning at McMullen. Will you go to the Lord and pray with me? With my whole heart, I seek you. Do not let me stray from your commandments. I treasure your word in my heart so that I may not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips, I declare all the ordinance of your, ordinances of your mouth. I delight in the way of your decrees as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. God, we thank you for this Lenten season where we can turn back to ourselves and ask ourselves how we are following you. We can look back on our lives and see our shortcomings, but also see our successes. We thank you, God, that you call us during this time to return anew to you, to turn away from ourselves, to turn away from the things of this world, and to focus our attention upon you. Guide us, Lord, during this season as we walk to the cross with you. Guide us to follow more closely your words, to understand the things that you have taught us, the things that you have given to us to make us better people, to make us more like you. God, we do understand that even in the midst of all the things you give us, of all the ways you show yourself to us through your Son, Jesus Christ, and through the Holy Spirit, we still turn away. We still follow after our own desires and after the desires of the world around us. We ask for your forgiveness. And we thank you for that forgiveness that was given to us through your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you, God, that you saw fit not to leave us alone, but to come and to be amongst us, to teach us, to guide us, and to offer us forgiveness and eternal life. We thank you, God, that you never stop coming into our lives, that you never cease giving us your spirit and offering us direction. And so we thank you for that, God. We thank you for your love, for your mercy, and for your never-ending grace. And God, we thank you in that grace that you hear us, that you hear our lives and see what it is that we go through, and that you understand us personally, what is happening but you also hear and see what we do, and you offer yourself to us. We thank you, God, that you hear our every words, even those that sit upon our hearts that we don't speak with our lips. You still know it, Lord. And so during this time, we want to lift those things up to you, God, those things that sit heavy upon us, and those things that we want to turn over to you. We lift up Mary Thompson and Virginia Brooks, and we pray, God, for the doctors and the nurses, that they will have wisdom and how to treat your people, and how to treat your children, Lord, that they may become better. And we pray for their families, Lord, that they may find ways that they can minister to your children and guide them to wholeness and healing. And we lift up the families of Peggy Connor and Betty Harden. Father God, we ask that you would allow them to open their hearts to you, 
that they would see you in a new and fresh way in this time of grief, that they would understand your presence and the gifts that you offer. And so we pray, God, that they would see you in a whole new way and feel your presence with them. And God, for those things that have not been spoken, we lift them up to you now. God, we thank you that you hear. You hear our groanings that we don't even know what we're saying, God, but you know what it is that we have upon our hearts. And we thank you, God, for listening and searching out our hearts. We pray, God, that you continue to guide us, guide us to turn ourselves over to you more and more each day, that we would turn away from the things of this world, that we would turn away from the desires of our flesh, and that we would focus on you and all that you have to offer us the abundant life through your son, Jesus Christ. And it is with him and with the church universal that we pray the words that he taught us to pray that brings us into community with one another. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
All right, if the kids want to join me up front on the stage. Good morning, everybody. That was a little weak. Come on. Good morning. Does anybody know what this is? A paper airplane. A paper airplane. Did y'all hear a lot of airplanes yesterday? Yeah. How do airplanes fly? Yeah. A gravity force called lift. That's a little deeper than I was going for. <laughs> <laughs> An engine. But you know what helps them fly? Wind. The wind. Good job, Grant. All right, so the wind. How, who's ever seen the wind? Y'all have? What's, what's it look like? It's clear. So how do you even know it's there? You can feel it. How do, sometimes it feels good on a hot day, right? And then sometimes when it's cold, you're like, I don't want it to be windy. You can kind of touch it when it's blowing around. Well, do y'all know it's like that? What? The air's like that. But also, we have Jesus here all around us called the Holy Spirit. And he's like that, right? Have any of y'all ever seen him? No, but you can feel them there with you sometimes when you're about to make a bad choice and you know you shouldn't or when you feel better after you've made a good choice, right? So when you go out and about and you see the wind blowing flowers and leaves everywhere, or wait, I think the air show is canceled for today, but next time you hear an airplane, you can think about ways to look for Jesus to be all around you too, okay? Does that sound good? All right, well, let's say a prayer together. Dear Lord, Thank you for this day and for springtime and for all of the beauty around us. Help us remember this week to look for you in everything around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings Let us pray. Heavenly Father, for the many ways that you pour your goodness into our lives, we give you thanks. We pray now as we come to give back to you that your goodness would overflow from our hands to bless your people. In Jesus' name we pray.
thankful for our, our worship and music and prayer. Uh, God blesses us in so many ways when we gather here at St. Mark. Uh, I want to tell you, this, this season of walking through the, the Apostles' Creed together, these kind of cornerstones of our Christian faith, it, it's been a blessing to me to have that in, as a part of our worship every week, to say together, to rehearse together, to speak together uh, that truth that we believe. And, I, and I'll invite you to stand again today as we unite our hearts in this historic confession of the Christian faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, whence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Thank you, church. We affirm that and we live in that together. And I can't believe we're already through uh, just half of that to this point. I believe in the Holy Spirit. And, and to believe in the Holy Spirit, we say, well, what is it even? that God has a spirit. Uh, what do we say when we talk about spirits uh, just among ourselves? Uh, this is March Madness time, NCAA Men's Basketball Tournament. Uh, I am for a limited time period. I am the bracket leader in our workplace, uh, in our church office bracket. Come on, give me some support here, people. <laughs> After today's game, that might not be the case. I mean, I might plummet to the bottom, but for this one moment, but for this one moment, I'm, I've got that winning spirit, right? You want your team, don't you, to have a winning spirit because a team, a team that wins, we say that, right? They have a winning spirit. Uh, you know, Georgia went out in the first round. Uh, some other locally connected didn't even make it to the bracket, so at least Georgia made it this time. Georgia State, who, who would have thought Georgia State best represented us? Any Georgia State people? No, no. Who, who would have thought Georgia State even would, would, go, would go deeper uh, after the first round, lost in the second round? The winning spirit. Um, when you have a losing spirit, though, you know that too, don't you? It's a different spirit. It's a different, it's almost as if all those people sharing that life together in relationship, that relationship becomes something different. Th think about it in this way. Uh, if, if you know a couple that's, that's gone through hard times and their, their relationship is rocky, there's a certain spirit that you, uh, that you experience in that marriage contrast that maybe with newlyweds in, in the joy of that moment or or even we don't say oldlyweds but we should maybe oldlyweds who, who still have persevered right and they've nurtured and, and they're living out that that sense of being related together. there's a certain spirit we encounter c.s lewis says this he says we talk of this as the spirit not only of the individual members of the group as a whole because the individual members when they are together they really do develop particular ways of talking and behaving which they would not have if they were apart. It is as if a sort of communal personality came into existence. Of course, that's not a real person. It's only like a person. But that's a little bit like what we experience with, with God, the Spirit, the, the Holy Spirit. As God loves the Son, Jesus, as God the Father loves the Son, Jesus, their relationship together makes us aware of another presence, another person. And that person, the person of love in the middle of the Trinity, that is the presence of God's Spirit. And it's so tempting. It's so tempting to walk through and give a long list because we don't often talk enough about the ministry of God's Spirit. It's, it's tempting to give like a long academic lecture about all the things the Spirit of God does. But I just want to tell you this. The Spirit of God makes new. The Spirit of God, God's Spirit, wants to make something new in, in individuals, in, in groups, in congregations, even in nations, I believe. And, and if you forget anything else from today, remember this. The Holy Spirit wants something new. He wants something new. I, I look briefly at Paul's letter to the, to the Ephesians, the fifth chapter. It's page 619 in the Red Pew Bible if you don't have your own Bible with you. 
Paul tells us this in Ephesians 5, 15. He says, be very careful then how you live. Uh Uh-huh, yeah, pay attention to the Holy Spirit, he's saying. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Oh God, we cannot live by bread alone. We live by every word which comes to us from your mouth. Open today our ears, our minds, and our hearts that we could receive and live in your living word who is Jesus Christ. Amen. The work of the Holy Spirit is to make something new. The work of the Spirit is to make someone new. The work of the Spirit is to make all things new. Uh, There's an ancient Christian prayer. Some of you know it. It, it, It's shaped out of the Scriptures, and the prayer begins this way. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth the Spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Who will renew the face of the earth? Not me and not you. The presence of God's Holy Spirit. The work of the Spirit is to make people, to make things, to make places new. Why? Because what we are and what we have is old. Let's let's just put a period there and say what we have is old. And that's not a statement of age. Uh, This is not about chronology. It's not about history. Uh, This is about something interior that can't be measured by calendars or dates. There is something about us as human beings that is old and that needs to be made new. Uh, From the very beginning of of the scriptures, those who have desired to walk with God have cried out that God would make things new. David, in Psalm 51, verse 10, said, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me of words there as we think about the ways that God wants to make us new. David cried out, created me a pure heart, a pure heart. Uh, At our house, there's some places that we, uh, when we're cleaning, uh, we like to use bleach. Uh, Some of you probably use bleach in the bathrooms or other places uh, because, uh, I mean, for us, it's like if if your nose isn't burning after you've cleaned it, it might not be clean enough. Right? Any, any of y'all use bleach? Y'all look, I mean, that's a real question. You, you, can, you can nod your head. It's good. And, and bleach has this dangerous thing, and, and, and we've done this, all of us, that have been tasked at one time or another with cleaning with bleach, is, is you clean and you think you're keeping it at arm's length, and then after you wash the clothes that you were wearing to do house, then you've got a new design on your shirt or on your pants because you brushed up against that uh, that countertop that was freshly cleaned and the bleach is just it's just it's cleansed its way where you didn't want to cleanse it right so you have to wear the old bummy clothes or whatever if you're using bleach here's the beauty of that though God's spirit wants to cleanse and wants to clean even deeper than bleach and and here's the, the, the 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 frightening thing is like bleach you can begin cleaning in one place and the bleach is gonna splat it's gonna end up somewhere you didn't anticipate the Spirit of God is not controllable in that way the Spirit of God once the Spirit of God begins to work cleansing in that in that powerful even better than bleach it won't burn your nose once the Holy Spirit begins cleansing it cleanses a little And then he wants to cleanse even more and clean. He wants to purify. He wants to reclaim what was old and make it fresh and make it new again. You've seen, you've seen the TV commercials, right, for, for cleanser where, the, where, where somebody comes in with the white glove, right? They're going to do the white glove test and, and, and run the glove along the windowsill or on the top of the mirror. And, and what happens, right? The white glove becomes dirty it becomes dusty here's the thing though when the holy spirit of god comes in and gives you the white glove treatment you become glovey 
You become glovey. That, that doesn't happen, does it? You put the white glove on. That doesn't happen on your windowsill. You can get one of those new marker things, those white marker. That, that works, but not the glove. The Holy Spirit touches you. He doesn't get your dirt. He doesn't get your impurity. He transforms your life. He makes you new. He makes you new. The ministry of the Holy Spirit is to make us pure and new. The Holy Spirit moves by God's gracious gift. The Holy Spirit moves to the place of our identified need, the places where we invite him to come and, and work forgiveness and work, work healing. The Holy Spirit has a way, too, of showing up in places that he perceives, that he perceives we need a deeper touch, a deeper cleansing, a deeper renewing. The Holy Spirit makes us clean and makes us new. Uh, David also prayed, renew a steadfast spirit within me. Steadfast. He, he, he works to make us new by making us pure. He can work to renew us by making us steadfast. When uh, Patty and I and our family moved to Columbus uh, a few years ago, we had lived, uh, we had been overseas for a few years, and we had lived in a furnished parsonage provided uh, by our former, uh, our former appointment, coming to Columbus, a different situation in our own home, uh, and, and we didn't have all the furniture that we needed, and so we made lists of you know, what we could live without and what we, you know, what we could make do with, and you, you've done that at different points in your life. We had a kitchen table, but we had no chairs. We had a kitchen table, but we had no chairs. But what we did have is, is on the farm, my dad has his metal building, his big shop, and he has uh, accumulated households worth of furniture from great aunts and others that have gone on to be with the Lord. And, and so we kind of went shopping out there, and, we, and we, uh, that's where we found the table that we had. <laughs> and we kept looking, we pulled back tarps, and we pulled back blankets, and we found the nastiest whole bunch of chairs that I think it actually belonged to, if not my grandparents, my great-grandparents maybe, and they were so rickety and they were falling apart, and I was like, they need to be kindling is all they need to be. And Patty said, no, 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 we can work with those things. And uh, I've got a cousin in, in Leslie, big town, who has a, a, an antique finishing place, and for just a few dollars, com compared to the cost of buying something new, for just a few dollars, he, he cleaned those things up, and, and he strengthened them, and, and they're not, you wouldn't want to stand in them, but they're steadfast, and, and they're still functional, and, and, and they, it was incredible. He took what was weak, and he made it strong. He took what was, what was rickety, and what looked like it was worthless, and he gave it renewed value. I'll tell you what, I, I sometimes feel like I need to pray David's prayer, renew in me a steadfast spirit. Because there are times that I feel rickety, I feel shaky, I feel weak, I, I, I feel like one more step and I, and, and I might slide down the, you know, kind of a, a, a gravelly kind of, kind of hill. And so I pray again, God, renew in me a steadfast spirit. I like the Beetle Bailey comic strip, you know, about, about military life, Greg and Mort Walker's strip. There's one particular uh, strip that has Sarge. Uh, Sarge is always gruff and angry, and in, in, this, uh, in this panel, he's fallen off a cliff, and he's holding on for dear life to the one branch that's, uh, that's there, and, and there's Beetle up on top, and Beetle's holding a rope, Beetle's holding a rope, uh, you know, Beetle, the, the, the weak, <laughs> the weak, rickety private, Beetle says, uh, Sarge, I'll throw you this rope if you promise not to beat me up again, or put me on KP. Or yell at me, or put me on latrine duty. <laughs> and he has all this whole long list of things that he can't take anymore because he's weak. Sarge looks down and says, I wonder how far, how far down it is. <laughs> Contrast that picture of, of, of one who is derelict in duty because of his weakness. To the photos we saw a year or two ago, it was after Superstorm Sandy, the, uh, the hurricane that drenched our, our eastern seaboard. Uh, the photos of the old guard, our soldiers who stand at the Tomb of the Unknown in the Arlington Cemetery. No matter the wind, no matter the rain, no matter any type of weather, they stayed and they stood and they protected and they defended. They were steadfast by the very dictionary definition, resolutely or dutifully firm and unwavering. 
Friends, that's where I cry out to the Spirit of God. That's where I cry out, and I hope you cry out to the Spirit of God to make me steadfast, that we would be steadfast. That may be the most serious needs we have as individuals and as families and as a family together at St. Mark. That God would make us steadfast. I, I remembered something earlier this morning. I, I remember that after my three years of serving as uh, your associate pastor here in the mid-90s, God sent us to another place and we had a chance to be in ministry. And that first summer, I, I prayed and I sought God's uh, direction for a, a vision for, for how ministry and life in that place would develop and some things some things floated to the surface of my mind and some things like this like like life centered in celebration before God life life in, in, in love and in fellowship around uh, around real tables with food but also around this table around the Lord's table recognizing his presence as Savior and Lord a leadership structure that was streamlined so that we could focus more on making disciples of Jesus and not just voting and making decisions. Friend, I wonder if I wonder if that vision God gave me then was more about now than about then. And I'm asking him again to make me steadfast. That I would stand, that I would not let go of him. Until I've seen, until I've lived, until I've experienced all that he wants me to see and live and experience. To be steadfast with God, to receive something new, is to be confronted and convicted by something old. Remember, I'm not talking about chronology here. I'm not talking about age or calendar or clock. If God's going to do something new, that means there's something old that needs to be cleansed, purified, strengthened and made steadfast. Paul told us, didn't he, in his letter, he said, be very careful, be very careful, be filled with the Spirit. Understand, he says, it's not a mystery, understand what the Lord's will is. The Old Testament's full of stories of renewal, kings who come and go and do their thing and Sometimes do God's thing. There was a king named Asa. He was the great-grandson of Solomon. You might think that that, that that set him up for success, but in the intervening generations between Solomon and Asa, many of the kings had gone their own way. They had forgotten Solomon's wisdom. And somehow the Spirit was working in Asa's life. And from the beginning, he called out to God. The Scripture says, help us, O Lord. This is how he led his life and his people. Help us. Lord our God, for we rely on you. Asa challenged himself. And he began cleaning out his own life. And he began cleaning out the worship life of his people. Even to the point of finding places. He even took on his grandmother. That's a whole other story. His grandmother was, a, uh, was still around. And she, she was an, idolater, an idol worshiper. And she said, Grace, this has got to go. This has got to be cleansed. God wants to do something new. God wants to do something new. That's what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit does something new. One more family story. I've, I've told you about some of my dad's heart health incidents, and you've prayed with me at different points. Uh, some of you know that uh, my appreciation for the coronary bypass in 1992, at age 48, my dad had his first bypass, so that's 23 years that we have had with him that we otherwise wouldn't have had. Uh, they've even in the intervening years done bypasses of his bypasses, so that's, I mean, that's how we've been blessed. But i tell you this, the Holy Spirit doesn't want a bypass. The Holy Spirit doesn't want a bypass. Now, now he will... He'll take a bypass. If I won't let him do what he wants to do in my life, he'll, he'll bypass. He'll, he'll do his thing with, with or without me. But he really doesn't want a bypass. What he wants is to do a whole transplant. He, he wants to change. He wants to take. Uh, the, the prophets cried out for that from centuries before the time of Jesus. Centuries before Jesus gave the gift of the Holy Spirit to his disciples. The prophets had cried out 
Oh God, take our, our firm, our, our stony, hard hearts. Take our hearts away. Give us a transplant. Give us something fresh and clean. Something that will, that will be shaped. Something that's moldable. Something that will grow and respond to your Holy Spirit. And in and through Jesus Christ, that's what God's done. Gone are the days of the bypass for hearts. God wants to transplant and give you a new heart. And he even wants to start that today. God wants something new. Do you want something new? Wanting something new is a momentary decision, but it's a momentary decision that sets the course for a lifetime of saying yes to God's newness in the presence of God's Spirit. John Acuff, a Christian writer, encourager, says this. He, he says, sometimes we miss the boat when it comes to courage. Oh, we think courage is, is just to do something and to respond to a call from God. But in reality, that's only the beginning of courage. Real courage is to do something and then to share with someone what we've done. To share with someone what God has done. I believe God is calling us by his spirit to experience newness. Newness as individuals. There's some of you here, I, I know, and, and you're experiencing, a, you're experiencing you, you have the experience of being bound up to a habit or a pattern of sin, and God wants to give you freedom. That's the new thing he wants to do through Jesus Christ. There's some, God... You, you, you're bound in despair, and God wants to do something new, and it's going to be joyful. Maybe there's confusion, and God, by his Spirit, wants to bring order. Or maybe there's staleness and too much order, and God wants to, by his Spirit, renew you into something fresh and moldable. Let the Spirit of God, let the Spirit of God be for you more than a line in the creed or the words of a the words of a, of a doxology or a hymn or a song as paul says be filled by the spirit be filled by the spirit let him do something new in you and let it begin today let it begin today and don't stop with that beginning of courage of letting god do. share that share that with a trusted friend Stop me at the end of the service. Stop and tell us what God, tell us what God is drawing you to. The Holy Spirit, he does what is new. He does what is new. Let there be for us a new Pentecost, a new outpouring, a new experience of the freshness and the joy of God's Spirit. Let us pray. Oh God, you are, you are so good to hear us when we pray. You come, you make pure, you make steadfast, you take the brokenness that we have to offer and you, you do more than we can ask or imagine with it. Come Holy Spirit, come Holy Spirit, kindle the hearts of your faithful and renew the face of the earth. Amen. Holy Spirit, Let your power fall, let your voice 
Sing it again. Holy Spirit, God's Spirit has been with us today. As you know that God's Spirit has rained down on your life and made you new. Go with that newness of life. Go filled with joy and peace in the Spirit. Go with the presence of Jesus to live with Him and for Him in the world. Go in His name. Amen.